If you've been around this channel long enough, you probably have come to the conclusion that things like heart disease and diabetes are not necessarily genetic in nature. So why would our eye health be any different? Stay tuned to today's episode to find out more. Welcome back, my friends. My name is Sarah. I am known as Carnivore Yogi. Thank you so much for being here and clicking on today's video. Today, I have an episode with Taylor DeGroote, who is an ophthalmologist and eye doctor, and we talk about what really causes poor eye health or myopia. We talk about cataracts, we talk about LASIK surgery. We go all over the place in talking about our eye health and then what is the root cause of a lot of disorders with the eyes? What actually does cause a cataract? Is it too much sun exposure, right? That's what we've been told, right? But we know again, as I mentioned in the beginning, that things like diabetes and heart disease are not something that are necessarily a death sentence if you change your lifestyle. So again, this episode is largely built around looking at your eye health through the lens of lifestyle. What is the best nutrition for your eye health? What are some exercises that you can be doing to improve your eye health? And why is the decline in eye health on the rise for people? I think you may have some good ideas, again, if you watch this channel about those topics, but to actually hear it from an eye doctor, someone who works with patients on a daily basis, who have things like myopia, again, cataracts, macular degeneration, I think you're gonna really enjoy what she has to say. So make sure you check out the timestamps linked down in the show notes. There are lots of them. We talk about a lot of different topics. And speaking of timestamps, just a quick little shout out to my two sponsors. The first one is going to be Optimal Carnivore. Now, one of the things that we did talk about in this episode is how important organ meats are to your eye health. So this is a great way to get those organ meats if you're not really a big fan of eating them. You can use my code carnivore uppercase Y to save at Optimal Carnivore and the link will be down in the show notes for you guys. That'll be over on Amazon. But again, a great way to get those organ meats if you're not a big fan of eating them. Second sponsor of today's episode is all about minerals, which is another topic we talk about in this interview towards the end and how vital our mineral balance is to our eye health. So if you wanna check out your mineral balance from home, you can get a hair tissue mineral analysis with a consultation from Upgraded Formulas. Use my code YOGI12 or YOGI to save. All right guys, enjoy today's episode. All right, everybody, thank you so much for coming back and tuning in. I'm really excited to talk with my guest today. She is an eye doctor and she sees things also through a more holistic and I, th I think kind of like a quantum lens. Um, her name is Taylor. So Taylor, thank you so much for being here today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, I would love, I mean, an eye doctor is not something that <laughs> most people kind of grow up and say like, that's what I want to do with my life. So mm -hmm. how did you become interested in actually being an eye doctor? How did that come about? Yeah. So actually, um, I didn't always know I wanted to be an eye doctor when I was, I always knew I wanted to be a doctor of some sort. Um, when I was a kid, I actually, I actually thought I wanted to be a doctor for babies. I wrote that in my yearbook. <laughs> I was like, I want to be a doctor for babies, but yeah. Um, I was just interested in the medical field and grew up going to the eye doctor and I just thought the eyes were fascinating. Um, and then my dog actually ended up having a lot of eye problems. He got cataracts really early on when he was only five years old. Um, and then just like retinal detachment, uh, glaucoma after that. So I kind of was going to his appointments with him and I got like really interested in um, healing the eyes. Wow. And you've, so you've had your own issues with your own eyes though, right? I think I heard you say on another podcast, like in the sixth grade is when you had to get glasses mm -hmm. for the first time. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't say I had like really bad eye problems, but it was right after I had like a stressful kind of like traumatic event mm -hmm. in my life. And I, the next year, um, it was during the summer and then the next year I needed glasses. Um, cause I just couldn't see the board far away anymore. Um, so I have a relatively like mild prescription, um, but I do 
think there was like a big emotional component uh, with my vision um, actually going downhill when it did. And I think for a lot of people, there's definitely an emotional component. I think, I mean, that's, that's really interesting. You say that I have um, two younger sisters and the middle sister got glasses when it was like, when our parents were going through this horrible divorce and she was the one who found out a bunch of stuff before we did. And she kind of kept it secret for a while. I feel like she was trying to carry the burden of for the two of us for a while. And then my youngest sister and I, we've never had really issues with our eyes, but Anna had to get glasses like right around that time that our mm-hmm. parents split up. So that's really yeah, interesting because I've never thought of that before. Yeah. And I'm like the only, like my siblings don't wear glasses. My mom has like perfect vision. Um, and, you know, they always say like, oh, it's genetic, you know, it's genetic. Right. But I think there's so much more to it. It has to do with like the light input that's getting into your eyes because that controls the growth of the eye with the dopamine Mm. um, that's released. And so when you get proper light exposure, that actually is like the main thing that controls the growth of the eye. So I guess part of it is like the nutrition and, you know, if your eyes have enough nutrition to grow properly and develop properly. Um, some of it is like the growth of the face. So like the facial development, which impacts, uh, like if your mouth breathing or if you have like tongue ties and stuff like that, that she had a tongue tie also that impacts the growth of the soft palate, which impacts the growth of the eyes. Wow. So there's like so many factors that, you know, aren't considered. And I think it's, kind of short-sighted how a lot of doctors just say oh it's just genetic um and then they they are recognizing now that a lot of uh, veneer work is also a big contributor and not going outside enough and they found that um even just like one extra hour of going outside and playing for kids a week is like a four a 15 percent reduction in in myopia wow that's fascinating and you know just this year I had started, well, it was about a year ago before I had really started getting kind of psycho about wearing blue blockers and Mm -hmm. mitigating my light environment. Like I'm inside right now, but the door is cracked open. (laughs) My husband actually just called me. I'm down at the beach and he's like, you know, our power bill was like $300 last month because you're always (laughs) opening the damn window. (laughs) We live in Georgia. He's like, you gotta just figure out something else to do. Like you're going to have to go outside or (laughs) because it is really nice having the windows open though. So I I have to like do a little crack (laughs) because otherwise it's like artificial light, even though it's coming through the glass, you know, I just, I know too much about this stuff, but he's just like, yeah, you gotta figure something else out. But (laughs) yeah. Um, I was starting to have an issue where I couldn't read things across the room. And I just thought Mm -hmm. that, you know, this is your four in your forties and this, when vision for people starts going downhill in their forties, quote unquote. And when I actually started going outdoors more, started seeing sunrise daily, wearing blue blockers at appropriate times, doing things like, you know, cracking a window whenever I'm indoors or in my car, I'm always cracking a window. I noticed that that my eyesight just totally went back to normal yeah. and I can read things across the room. No problem. And I'm like, yeah. is that, <laughs> and you're not the first person that I've heard that from. Like really? I've heard from people that they don't need, they used to need glasses, uh, like for reading glasses. And since just like going outside more, looking far away in the distance, um, even people with myopia, they told me just taking off their glasses and going outside more and looking far away um, can literally like reduce their myopia and get rid of their need for reading glasses, um, partially because you're increasing the resiliency um, in the eye muscles when you're using your eyes to look far away again. Um, what happens when we look up close too much is we can kind of paralyze the ciliary muscle and um, it kind of gets stuck and it doesn't relax as well as it used to because you're just looking up close so much that the muscle kind of gets stuck and then when you want to look far away it doesn't even fully relax anymore so it's relaxing but it's not fully relaxing to where it should be yeah I mean what are most of us doing I mean I'm on my computer I've got iris on which is somewhat helpful but it's still 
some eye strain involved in being on a computer, even if you have a protective software like yeah. Iris, you know, most of us are on our phones and most people don't turn their screen red. You know, most people yeah. are just like staring at it like this all day. And, and people look at my screen, they're like, how do you see with that red? You know, me too. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, um, it's just something you gotta do. <laughs> you just get used to it. I know yeah. my husband's always like, oh, my wife and her red phone, like, <laughs> But if you, if you feel, you actually feel a difference. I mean, I feel a difference in my nervous system. And then I also feel like my eyes are way more relaxed when yeah. looking at a red screen. Is there like, from your point of view, a reason why the eyes are a little more relaxed when there's like the phone is red or you have iris on your computer? Yeah. So it's interesting because from the perspective of um, syntonic light therapy, Mm -hmm. um the blue and the green spectrum is supposed like if you have like a filter is supposed to be more relaxing mm -hmm. and then the red and the yellow is supposed to simulate the sympathetic nervous system which is why like with syntonic light therapy most people do like blue lenses oh. um but I think it really has to do with the eye strain aspect of it like the blue the harsh blue light really does strain your eyes because it's like a shorter wavelength and um it's definitely causing eye strain and even even just like putting on red light and looking at it it does have a relaxing effect on me personally oh, yeah. but definitely. Um, yeah I definitely noticed that too <laughs> Yeah. I think there's so many little things that we can do that we can tweak that I think are going to contribute to keeping the eyes healthy. Um, and then I've had Victor Mifsud on the podcast before too. And we talked a lot about, you know, he's trying to basically like reverse a blindness right condition. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Which, you know, you're told that that's something that's not reversible. If you have a prescription that you're stuck with a prescription and there's not really much you're going to be able to do except continue basically either renewing that prescription or it's going to have to get stronger over time. But do you, I mean, from your point of view, you think that people can kind of go the opposite way? Yeah. So what a lot of people don't realize is that um, when cells in the retina, when they tell you that, you know, it's dead, you can't get back lost vision, the cells actually might be in a dormant state. And so they're deactivated. Um, but they can be reactivated when given the right inputs. So um, one of the things that can be really helpful is um, microcurrent simulation um, because there's like special microcurrent devices that you can use for the eyes. And basically it's gonna help increase the circulation to the eye because when, the circ when we increase the circulation, we can get more nutrition to the eye and you can actually reactivate dormant cells mm. that way. Um, and then other ways is like microacupuncture that people can do, um, things like syntonic light therapy, because that's relaxing the nervous system because the eyes are part of brain tissue. So when we're developing, the eyes actually come from the same tissue that the brain comes from. Um, so since the eyes are just basically an extension of the brain, uh, we can really use the brain to get back lost vision and with the whole premise of neuroplasticity it's basically like your brain there's so much like we're, they say like we only use like one percent of our brain and you know it's probably the same with the eyes too like we're not using all of mm -hmm. what we could just because we're always strengthening the same neural pathways but if we're able to do things to change the um the neural pathways that we're using so you can even like in vision therapy, for example, one of the things that we do to rewire the visual system with the brain is we can put on prism glasses and the prism glasses, what they do is it shifts the image. Um, and so basically if you put both prisms facing the same way, so instead of the image being over here, it's over here now. And what happens is the brain is able to adapt. So if you put on the prism glasses and you're, let's say you're throwing a ball at a target, the first time you throw the ball at the target, you're gonna be way off. Mm. Like, and then you keep throwing it. And it's the craziest thing because what happens is the brain realizes, okay, the image is now in a different place than we're used to seeing it at. And then all of a sudden after like five, six tries of throwing the ball, you adapt and you're finally like hitting it at the right spot. 
Ah. Um, so in vision therapy, that's one of the ways you get the brain um, to be more responsive to the therapy is using prism glasses and switching up the inputs that are going from the eye to the brain wow. using prisms. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. Is that, and I'm sure that's nothing like insurance would ever cover. That's something people have to <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, unfortunately, it's not covered by insurance, um, which is a real downside because a lot, of, like a lot of people, could benefit from vision therapy. Like, yeah. I've seen kids like go up like three or four reading levels just from wow. vision therapy um, because the vision is like the main input. It's the main thing that you have to optimize if you want to be a quick learner. Yeah, um, because that's basically the like the connection to the brain. Wow. So it's really, really, really super helpful uh, for a lot of kids. And you even see like, even like if someone has a convergence insufficiency, which means that um, their eyes are pointed too far outward and they don't turn in enough mm. where they need to be. Um, if you put like a small prism on them, like five basically prism diopters in both eyes and you just make their eyes basically put the image where their eyes are at, you'll see their posture change like immediately wow, and how they interact with the world because like it's such a relaxing thing for the nervous system um, wow. to get to like calm down and not have to strain so much to see. That's fascinating. You know, we've, we looked into doing some sort of vision therapy for my daughter. It's like, she just, she needs a lot of stuff, you know, as a, a, child with non-speaking autism, it's like, mm -hmm. what do we choose from to mm -hmm. help her the most? And so we've really sunk all of our time and money into like the spelling to communicate therapy. Cause I think communication yes. is like the most, especially since she's like a teenager now and she's <laughs> got all the teenage hormones and like yeah. the attitude. And so she needs to be able to communicate with us. But one of the things that I noticed with her, and I don't know if you know much about kids on the spectrum is that she has for her whole life really looked out of the peripheral vision. Like she's, mm -hmm. I can just see her kind of like, she sees everything differently. And anytime she can be outside, she wants to just be outside. Like she doesn't like being indoors. If she has an iPad, she doesn't want to actually look at it. She just wants to listen to the music, which mm -hmm. I try not to even let her have it because the non-native EMF and all that stuff. But I've always been like, ah, I really wonder what the kind of vision component. And I know a lot of kids on the spectrum kind of struggle with that. Like they just look yeah. out of the corners of their eyes. Do you know anything mm -hmm. about that type of condition? Um, always looking out of the corner of their eye. That's interesting. So it could be that maybe she's seen clearer that way or yeah, I don't know. I'm not really sure, but it could just be that the peripheral vision is more relaxing because when you're is. focused, when you're focused on the central part of your vision, that's more like fight or flight mode. Yep. Um. So it's more just like you're you're only focusing on the central vision when you're only when you only care about survival. So when yep. you're in survival mode, you're just focusing on the central vision. Tunnel peripheral vision, right? vision. Yeah, tunnel vision. Um, peripheral vision is definitely more relaxing. A lot of people don't realize that they're mm -hmm. actually not even using their full peripheral vision. They're so heavily just relying on the central vision when they should be just taking in the whole scene. They're only focusing on the central part of your vision. Wow. Um, which is interesting because the macula, which is this called like the sweet spot of your vision, I'm sure there's more like connections going to the macula because it's like the most important um, for your vision and for survival mode. So if you're constantly strengthening that area, you're kind of losing out on like how, how you're supposed to effortlessly see in wow. the world. So there's a technique called open focus. And basically um, what you realize when you do this is that when you focus really hard, you don't see the periphery. So the more uh -huh. focused you are on something, the more tunnel vision you have, the more relaxed you are, the more peripheral vision you have. That makes me wonder if somebody has like prescription glasses, does that make them kind of lose the ability to, to have the peripheral vision in any yes. way? Yeah. So, um, glasses, they actually have an optical center, which is the point of clearest vision out of the glasses. So if your eyes look away from the optical center, you see distortions. 
So the glasses train your eyes to have less peripheral vision wow. because you always want to look through the optical center where you have the least amount of distortions. So um, that is one of the only benefits to contacts is that you have more peripheral vision with contacts. Okay. Um, with glasses, you have less peripheral vision and it's kind of like visual confinement because you're just training your eyes. This is where we have to look um, for clear vision. And when you actually are able to move the eyes around, it helps us access emotions. Ah. Actually, So there's an emotional component with, you know, being locked in and always wearing glasses. Wow. That's fascinating. I get so many people as we were talking before I turn on the camera that talk to me about, um, because I'm a big proponent of sunrise, bare eyes, UVA light, bare eyes, you know, taking mm -hmm. breaks throughout the day to mm -hmm. get natural light in your eyes. Um, and I, every time I do a post like that, I'm always kind of bombarded by the, like, what about glasses? What about contacts? And I'm like, well, unfortunately those are blocking <laughs> the beneficial rays. So, and I always tell people, can you take breaks from them? Like, you know, mm -hmm. what, how do you help people in that situation? Yeah. So, um, I usually recommend a reduced prescription. So the, the reduced prescription, what it does is it helps your eyes relax a little bit more. Um, some people can actually improve just from reducing the prescription a little bit, um, just because most people are over minus. Mm. So when you go into the eye doctor, um, it's very unnatural conditions, first of all. Oh, yeah. Like the There's lighting is very, lights. Yeah. yeah, the blue lights, blasting. Um, you're probably more stressed. So that's going to affect your vision yeah. because it's like, this, whatever you say is going to affect your prescription and you don't want to get it wrong. So a right. lot of people have that mentality where they go in and they're like, I just want to say the right thing, you know, like, yeah, uh, totally. the people pleasing aspect really comes out. Yes. Um, and so under those unnatural, and then on top of that, they put drops in your eye. So the drops that they put in impact the eye muscles. Um, so that impacts the prescription as well. And so most people have too much power in their glasses already. Mm. And what they don't think about is that the glasses are kind of like the worst case visual scenario correction. So that's what you need to see 20 feet away, which is optical infinity. So that's the mm. farthest distance that you'll need. Um, but most of the time in our day-to-day -day life, we don't need that strong of a correction. So naturally what the eye is able to do is the eye is able to accommodate for different distances. And that is like flexible vision. It's natural. And that's what your eyes supposed to do. When you're wearing the correction, it kind of stifles the natural movement that's supposed to happen with the lens and the eye and the mu eye muscles. And that actually like increases the progression because then people are wearing their worst case visual scenario correction for their computer and their phone. Mm -hmm. um, and then they're way, way overpowered and they're stressing out the muscles and it just makes the progression worse. Got it. Yeah. And, you know, just as far as like the whole circadian aspect goes, I always tell people with glasses I, and Dr. Jay Montgomery, I don't know if you, if you're familiar with him at all, he's been on the show before. Um, but he always says, if you wear glasses, kind of put them down on the bridge of your nose so you can get the natural light when you're outside, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. or take them off. But what I about people off, yeah. with, um, with contacts, like how can they, yeah, I so there's the whole circadian one, aspect. There's one contact lens brand. It's called Daily Total One. Okay. And that one actually doesn't block UV light. Okay. And it's actually the best lens just because it has the most oxygen permeability. Um, and it's water-based. It's not like silicone based. Uh, some of the contacts have like silicone oil uh mm. based contacts. So it's definitely the healthiest lens, um, the best oxygen and the healthiest for your eyes. Um, so I do recommend that one. That's pretty much like the only one I, I recommend. Okay. Um, yeah. So that's what you could do. And then you can always get a reduced prescription so that you're not, you really only, um, you only need 2040 to drive with. Okay. Um, so I usually don't recommend going, if you're just starting out reducing the prescription, I don't recommend seeing worse than that. Okay. Uh, the 2040. But it really also depends on the person and the amount of blur that's tolerable to them. Yep. Um, so some people, if you're more type A, you probably uh, notice 
fluctuations like that more than a more relaxed person. Would. Interesting. And how do you feel about, I mean, I'm sure I know how you feel about, but I'd love for you to talk how you feel about sunglasses with, um, my yeah. viewers. Yeah. So the problem with sunglasses is that they cut out all the UV light and it heavily distorts the light spectrum. So we really want full spectrum light because it allows us to absorb vitamin D. Um, light, it's so important for like blood sugar regulation, immune function, even optimizing your gut microbiome. All of that is, you know, depends on the sun for regulation. So what I would recommend when out in the sun is I do think that if you're out for like a really long period of time, you should have some protection. Um, so there's different foods that can protect us like mm -hmm. vitamin E, vitamin C, um, zinc, iodine, vitamin A, saturated fats like butter. Those are all going to protect us from the UV light. And then especially the vitamin C, the vitamin C mm. is actually very protective against the UV light. So if you're going to be out in the sun for a while, I do recommend upping like the antioxidants, especially vitamin E and vitamin C, um, cause that's going to be super protective for your eyes. And then in addition, I like wide brimmed hats. Mm -hmm. Um, I, if you're, if you need, need, need to do the sunglasses, um, I would recommend a neutral gray tint. Um, because the neutral gray tint actually cuts down on the visible light spectrum. So then you're making the spectrum more balanced by cutting down on both the UV light and the visible light spectrum. Got it. Yeah. I was in a meeting the other day. I'd never seen, I think a guy that I met had the, the gray glasses <laughs> because mm -hmm. I had, we were, we were in this meeting and there's these horrible fluorescent lights overhead. And I'm so mm -hmm. sensitive now that I kind of have this awareness. Like I actually will start getting a headache and I'll start feeling yeah. like I'm moving into more of sympathetic, um, nervous yeah. system state if I'm under like some horrible fluorescent light. So I had my yellow raw optics oh, on yes. and he had his like gray lenses on mm -hmm. and I had never seen those before. So I'm assuming that's kind of, he was like, oh yeah, that's what my eye doctor gave me when I'm in, um, rooms like this, or when I'm outside, because I just yeah. get like, it's overstimulating and it gives me yeah. a headache. And I'm like, Oh, I've never seen those before. So the gray lenses are good for people that have like light sensitivity mm -hmm. yeah. because it cuts down on the visible light spectrum a lot. So a lot of, uh, patients that have, you know, really bad, poor vision that actually helps them with glare and light sensitivity a lot. Okay. So that's an alternative because I, a lot of times if I post about not wearing sunglasses, I will get at least 30 comments of yeah. I drive all the time. And I'm like, I live in Georgia where it's really bright and sunny and my eyes are like gray and I can handle it. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. <laughs> like, yeah. but I don't want to tell anyone something that's, that's going to make them unsafe. So you mm -hmm. would say if they're in that situation, like driving, there's a glare, yeah. like Get neutral some, gray neutral tint. gray okay yeah, that's what you want got it and they should still probably crack the window as well and try yeah, to like because you're still in. getting like you're still getting a little bit from the side um yeah. but they've actually found that like they always blame like pterygium on the sun but yeah. they found that um there was like this study done on the Cree people and they didn't live in like a tropical climate but there was it was like a lot of ice and stuff so they were getting a lot of I guess reflection uh, from the sun yeah but they were wearing like these wraparound sunglasses like they were oh. wearing like heavy duty sunglasses and they actually had a really high rate of pterygium in that um, community so it definitely isn't just the sun there's definitely a lot more at play there yeah I mean <laughs> I mean I'm sure you get this too on Instagram I get like the most the people that I'm like what on earth I would never expect to even come in contact with this person I'm like <laughs> somewhat the other day was like well I'm in Bavaria you know the most great place on earth blah 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 because I was talking about vitamin d and then um I was talking about sunglasses and someone said yeah we live on top of like snow caps so we have to protect our eyes I'm like I just don't know. <laughs> yeah. But it's like, does that, the sunglasses even work? Cause then you're just distorting the light spectrum and causing other damages. Um, so right. I think mitigation and, you know, protection with your diet and mitigation with things like hats is like the best solution. 
um ideally there could be like a better sunglass made maybe like if there's like only 50 percent of the uv rays cut down and then a gray tint over that but it seems to me like all the sunglasses cut down on 100 percent of the uv light yeah. yeah and stuff like cataracts right like mm-hmm. i get a lot of people that say that their eye doctor says it's because there's too much sun that they've Mm -hmm. been exposed to. And I know we can't be dumb. Like we can't like stare completely at the sun and just like look at it all day. Cause that is not going to be healthy for the eyes. Mm -hmm. But what do you think about when eye doctors say the sun has caused a lot of damage to your eyes for like the average person who maybe even like works indoors? (laughs) I I don't agree with that. It's the only cause. Um, you definitely do see it more, But I think, you know, people are not doing the right thing with the sun. So they're not properly um, fueled with the proper nutrients to protect them. That's one of the causes. They're wearing sunglasses all the time, which is making the spectrum so uneven. Um, And then the other problem is that non-native EMF is a big driver of cataracts, um, Uh as well as um, glycation. Patient and the lens proteins. Also, you know, calcification is playing a big role. Um, the depletion of the antioxidants in the eye. So the main ones are vitamin C and glutathione. Those are the two main antioxidants that are protecting against the cataracts. And those are being depleted with diet and things like that. Um, diabetics get cataracts a lot, mm-hmm. a lot sooner because the blood sugar dysregulation is driving that. Um, and then people that are exposed to radiation too. So that you see like radiation type, there's different types of cataracts. That's what people don't really uh. um, know is that there's different cataracts for a diabetic. You can see like a special type of cataract if someone's diabetic. Um, you'll see there's a different type of cataract that you see with radiation poisoning and things like that. So there's a lot of different causes and it all comes down to um, nutrient depletion and, you know, depletion of the antioxidants they're being used up and oxidative stress. So iron is a big cause of oxidative stress. Um, and I actually do like bioresident eye scans and I often see iron coming up on people's eye scans because it's causing a lot of, especially to the eyes they are super susceptible. Um, so because they have a really high metabolic rate. So the iron-induced oxidative stress is another uh, big cause of it. Interesting. Yeah, I would love to dive deeper into the whole nutritional portion of this because I think my audience is definitely interested in that because I think Mm -hmm. so many of our different health problems are caused by mineral and nutrient either overload Mm -hmm. or deficiency and getting down to that with the eye would be, and like you said, antioxidants, right? So the vitamin yeah. C, vitamin E, vitamin those are C, huge. Vitamin C, vitamin E, those are big. Um, B vitamins are going to be really important um, just for like the metabolism mm. and supporting your thyroid function. Um, so like copper, um, taurine can be really helpful for supporting the liver because the eyes are very connected to the liver. Oh. Um, supporting collagen health. So I really like bone broth things like chicken feet, um, supporting collagen health with MSM. There's MSM eye drops, and then you can also take that internally. Um, I really like Tudka to support the liver. Mm. Um, So all these things that you can do, like castor oil packs, it's really going to help keep your eyes healthier for longer. Interesting. And I guess the whole iron thing is really interesting. I've, I've talked to Morley Mm -hmm. a few times and I try to, I try to like listen in on a lot of these conversations about iron overload and, and zinc Mm -hmm. and copper. How exactly does that work with the eye? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, iron basically causes a lot of oxidative stress in the Mm -hmm. eye um, because we're all exposed to like excess amounts of it in the food. A lot of people grew up on the fortified food. Yeah. Especially if you were eating cereal as a kid. (laughs) That was my favorite cereal. (laughs) (laughs) There's like iron shavings in there. Um, All of that dysregulates the copper regulation, which impacts ceruloplasmin and vitamin A status. And we know that vitamin A is super, super important for the eyes. Yes. Um, especially, um, for the photoreceptors. Yes. 
So um, all those things are going to impact, you know, your eyes and how long they're good for and all things like that. So I think that's what a lot of people don't realize is that um, the rods and the cones, they really need vitamin A to function properly. Um, I've heard cod liver oil. Mm. Oh, I've heard a lot about the cod liver oil recently and people saying that it helps their vision. It helped their oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah and things like beef liver raw dairy uh, butter eggs that's all going to be really good for the vitamin a that's awesome and i feel like there's a lot of people that are like afraid of vitamin a there's been (laughs) it circulates through the whole health space every now and then vitamin a toxicity and i'm i'd love to hear your thoughts on on that yeah Um, I think it depends on your thyroid function, right? Ah. I think there's probably a sweet spot for everyone, but depending on your thyroid, your thyroid depends on how much you need. Also Mm. depends on how much sun you're getting. Yes. Um, since the vitamin A and vitamin D are kind of on a spectrum. Yes. So I really think it's, it's very bio-individual, um, for every person. So I do think you should get your, uh, your levels tested before Uh, like going full force with like the beef liver. I definitely think there's a sweet spot. I agree. Um, And something that's good for one person might not be good for another person. So I definitely think you need to find what works for you. I agree. I I feel like there's never a talk about how like zinc and copper balance one another out and A, D, E, and K are Mm -hmm. all in synergy with one another. They're just, Mm -hmm. there's no nuance in that conversation. And it's like, I'm pretty tan right now. I'm pretty fair skinned, but I've been laying out quite a bit and just Mm -hmm. getting in the sun. So I've actually been, and I'm pregnant and I'm actually consuming more of the vitamin A rich foods, because I know that all that vitamin D that my body is making, I need more vitamin A, right. And I need more folate too, because folate is something that gets depleted if you've got too much vitamin D. And so Mm -hmm. it's like, you you have to be smart about that. Everything's on a spectrum. And like, I don't think that you can just, you know, take one thing and Mm -hmm. like, I don't think there's any silver bullets Mm -mm. where like, you know, if you just you know, just take cod liver oil and your vision will be great. Like (laughs) it really just depends on like your personal nutrient needs and everyone is different. And everyone also has like different genetic makeups and Mm -hmm. like where your ancestors are from. I think that also plays a role in how much um, nutrients you need. Yeah. But I I also don't think that like you can demonize like a nutrient and just say like, oh, you know, this is bad for you. (laughs) Like you obviously need it, but it's in varying amounts depending on the person. I agree. Yeah. And every time I do a post where I talk about one of my sponsors is a desiccated beef organs, desiccated beef liver, I'll get people commenting, you need to interview this person about vitamin A toxicity, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, no. (laughs) Yeah. I just like, don't want to open that can. I kind of just don't want to do that because (laughs) I've listened to the research that they put out there and I just don't feel like it's applicable based on the other knowledge that I have and talking to, you know, so many other different experts and nutritionists in this field where it's like, get, get your son, you know, get the circadian rhythms, right. Get your redox function up and don't eat pounds and pounds of beef liver. Like you're not supposed to be doing that anyway, but, you know, some desiccated organs is not going to kill you. you Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I think like when people think when people realize like, Oh, this is really good for me. Like they can go overboard sometimes. Definitely take it to like the next level. Yeah. Um, and you know, like, even if you think about like, that's not how people were eating it, you know, even like in ancestral times, (laughs) like people weren't just like pounding the beef liver like every single day (laughs) like no 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 they didn't have access to it that wouldn't make any sense yeah everything I try to look at more through like an ancestral lens now and it's like I feel like when you look at something like vision the more that we get away from the way that nature has intended us to live and eat that's Mm -hmm. something that's going to be affected in more and more people because I feel like more and more people have vision problems now than they had, you know, than they used to, do you see a lot more of that? Yeah. Um, I think it's like 50% of the world is going to be myopic pretty soon. Um, 
mainly just because the lighting is terrible. People yep. spend all their time indoors um, and so much near work that's paralyzing the muscle in the eye. And then there, it, the muscle is not able to relax anymore and it wow. just gets locked in. And my view is just like so, so on the rise. The sad part is that they're advocating for all these like different pharmaceutical ways to fix it now. Um, so they're doing like low dose atropine um, to try to like slow the progression of it, um, which I don't know, like <laughs> maybe just go outside. <laughs> right. And then they're doing like ortho K, which is like um, kind of like a retainer contact lens for your eye to wear at night. And it literally flattens the cornea overnight so that you can see during the day. And then you have to wear it at night. Yeah. Interesting. It's getting, yeah. It's getting wild. <laughs> yeah. What they're trying to do. I was bummed out with the um, New York Times article that came out recently because they were talking all about circadian rhythms and health. And they were talking about how, I mean, they were finally bringing out how intricately these things are, are tied together. But they were wrapping the article basically by saying that they were trying to come up with some sort of pharmaceutical or some sort of a pill to help people with their circadian rhythms. I'm like, why would you just not tell someone to like, go watch sunrise and like (laughs) try to build your life. So you have these little five minute bursts. I mean, you don't have to spend all day outdoors. Like if you can awesome, but like just five minute bursts here and there can make a world of difference for people yeah. in everything from their eyesight to their metabolism, you know? Yeah. Even right. for like, um, presbyopia, they're mm-hmm. even, they even just came out with an eye drop for that to take people off of reading glasses, What? but it doesn't really work. <laughs> and I've, I even saw people getting like retinal detachments from it. And really? Stuff like that. Yeah. Because oh it's not supposed to be that prescription medication is not supposed to be used every day and it's going to have an effect on your eyes long term. So, wow. I would be wary of thing quick fixes like that. Wow. And I saw a post on your Instagram, just speaking of eye drops, like how mm-hmm. terrible are the eye drops actually for your eyes? <laughs> like the Visine. Yeah. Like the Visine is really bad because what it does is it constricts the blood vessels so that you're not having as much blood flow but then after doing that the body tries to compensate for it so there's a rebound effect and then the blood vessels dilate even more than before because now it's like oh no like rush all the blood in because we were just getting less blood than we needed so now they now the eye is basically like oh, okay we need a lot more blood now so now we have to make the blood vessels even wider and then so people just get caught up in that and putting those in every day but meanwhile like if they focus on, you know, the root cause of what's causing the redness, they could eradicate the problem. Um, So it's more just like people want all these quick fixes, right? And in the end, it's just going to make the problem worse most of the time. What would be something that could cause redness in the eye? Yeah. So um, a lot of it, I I see this in a lot of contact lens wearers, I guess, because their eyes aren't getting enough oxygen throughout the day. Mm. Um, and their eyes are just getting irritated from the contact lens solutions and things like that. So that could be one reason is that you're just, your eyes aren't getting enough oxygen. They're not getting enough light because, so they're more stressed. Um, so I do see that a lot with contact lens, whereas, um, people that have like histamine issues and allergies, Mm. they can get red, red itchy eyes. Um, so just like supporting copper metabolism, um, beef kidney is something that you can take to support. Um, the DAO enzyme that regulates histamine, um, things like that. Um, Taurine eye drops are, they're pretty cheap and they're actually really good for um, supporting the eyes and for detoxification. Um, MSM eye drops are going to be really kind of nourishing instead of using like relying on like the other over-the-counter eye drops. Um, There's homeopathic eye drops that I like. Um, just if you feel like your eyes are a little bit dry, you've been staring at the computer for too long and not blinking enough. Um, when we, when we're on the computer, we tend to stare. So when we stare, we're actually not blinking as much as we should be. Ah, okay. So when you're on the computer, that's one of the main causes. And then the other cause is that there's a blue light imbalance and that's going to activate the sympathetic nervous system. 
Um, and since your eyes are so connected to the nervous system, um, the parasympathetic nervous system controls all of the lacrimal gland secretions and the meibomian gland secretions as well. So there's three layers to the tears. All the layers of the tears are pretty much impacted by the nervous system. Oh, really? Yeah. So that's a big cause, just being stuck in chronic fight or flight, not staring at the computer, not blinking. Um, and then look at your environment. What's the humidity like in the environment? Um, is it a really dry environment? Um, is there mold? A lot of people who have live in moldy environments, they get like clogged glands over here. Oh. Um, they get redness like burning eyes, they'll kind of wake up with that. So look at, you know, when your eyes are affected. Um, If if you're waking up a lot like that in the morning, you might want to look into your breathing, how you're sleeping. Mm -hmm. Are you breathing through your nose or your mouth? If you're mouth breathing, that can cause more dryness in the morning. Really? Mm -hmm. Um, So I would, you know, just look into things like that, optimize your environment, getting an air purifier. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the other thing with the computer is a lot of times people aren't breathing when they're on the computer. They're yes. like in this hunched then, over that's state. That's literally me right now. <laughs> but yeah, like literally like hunching over, you're not getting the, the connections from your spine are, and like your brain doesn't work as well when you're slouching. Exactly. So you're not going to be getting like the right neural impulses going up to the brain from the spine. And that impacts the eyes as well. Wow. That's fascinating. And um, how do you feel about LASIK? I know I'm sure you get that Mm -hmm. question quite a bit. I do. Yeah. So I don't really like LASIK just because um, it's a stress. It's a huge stress to the visual system. Any surgery is. Um, It's really going to disrupt the vitreous. Um, It puts you at more of a risk for dry eyes because it's Mm -hmm. cutting the corneal nerves. Um, It's also when the flap heals, it's held down by a weaker scar tissue. Mm. So it puts you at risk at any point. If you ever get hit in the eye or anything, the flap can dislodge Ah. and that can impact your vision. And then also, if you think about it, if you're impacting the vitreous, you're putting yourself at a higher risk for getting cataracts earlier. Mm. And then you're putting yourself at risk for a posterior vitreous detachment. Wow. So they found that people that have LASIK have more of a risk for that. And then also, I kind of always wonder, like, does it impact like the wavelengths of light that's hitting your That's what I was going to ask next. Yeah, exactly. Because it's like a standpoint. Yeah, because if you're changing the thickness, basically, that's what you're doing. You're creating a thinner um, surface on the eye. That's going to have to have some impact on the wavelengths of light. So I think it is uh, um, related to depression too. I've Ah. like read the different um, lot. There's like this whole, there's this website. um, What's it called? It's called like LASIK. I forgot what it's called, but it's called like LASIK complications or something like that. And all these people are writing in about like people getting depressed after LASIK. Wow. And I always thought maybe it was because of like the wavelengths of light that are hitting their eyes is different now. Yeah. I've, I've heard that that's the circadian aspect of it. It's just like, you're not really getting the true, um, like you said, wavelengths of light. And I'm sure people listening to this, there's some people that are like, crap, I've had LASIK, you know, and I've had people message me and they're like, I've had LASIK. Am I screwed? Like, what can I do? What are your thoughts on? Yeah. So I do, do, um, whenever I do like an eye scan on someone that had LASIK, um, the, the, bioresonance machine will tell me like how stressed their eye is Mm -hmm. and oftentimes the eye is like very stressed so one of the areas that I see being very stressed with LASIK is actually the vitreous Mm -hmm. Um, so for the vitreous to be healthy um, you need structured water so Uh I would really I would really focus on uh, structured water getting you know UV light in the eyes because that helps to structure water in the eyes and just really um, keeping up on like the antioxidants and the food and increasing circulation, um, working on relaxing your eyes. Um, there's different exercises you can do um, just because your eyes really control the nervous system. Mm-hmm. So a lot of people don't realize that like 
people heavily, heavily rely on your visual system. And so a lot of the nervous system stress is stemming from the eyes. Ah. Um, so if you're clenching your jaw, right? Like if you have, you know, pelvic floor, if your pelvic floor can't relax, all of that is related to whether or not your eyes are able to relax. Mm. That makes so sense. So that's why I think learning how to relax your eyes can really help relax everything. Um, even just like doing some vision exercises to strengthen your non-dominant eye, because all of us have a dominant eye. Oh. Um, you can actually test this out. You can figure it out. So if you put your hands together and you make a, a triangle mm -hmm. and then look at something far away and center it in the triangle, um, I can just like probably show you. So like, like this. That? Okay. And then like, let's say I'm like focusing on the cloud. Okay. If you just don't focus on the cloud, but center it and then just bring it toward your face. I always go to my right eye. So my, I'm right eye dominant. So basically you center it and then you look at the object and mm -hmm. then just slowly bring it toward your face by while you're keeping the object centered. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. A right and eye so, for me too. <laughs> yeah. So what's interesting is that if you're right eye dominant, you're more likely to have a left head tilt and then oh. you're more likely for your jaw to go toward the dominant side. How interesting is that? That's very interesting. So wow. if you strengthen your non-dominant eye, that can have like benefits on like your posture. And I was going to say like chiropractic adjustments and things like that. Yeah. Cause it's yeah. my, my right hip always like gets messed up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like I've been doing a ton of chiropractic since like week 24. Cause I got to the point where it was like, I couldn't walk very well. And I'm like, I still have a few months of pregnancy to go. So we need to fix this. <laughs> yeah. So I have to go every week or like, I can't, it hurts, you know, but as long as I go to chiropractic, I'm fine. But it's always my right hip that they're like, yep, it's like pinning under again. It's pinning under. So that's like, that's really interesting to think about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So a lot of people don't realize how like astigmatism is related to posture, like a lot. And so uh -huh. even like even cranial sacral therapy mm -hmm. and things like that can actually get rid of astigmatism because you're kind of like unwinding the twist in the body. And when you unwind, like all the fascial adhesions, things just normalize in the body. Yeah. My daughter, we used to do cranial on my daughter, like every week and she loved it. I mean, she would never sit still for anything, but she would mm -hmm. love to lay there. Cause it would, mm -hmm. she would feel so much better. She would sleep better. Yeah. She'd go to the bathroom better. Like everything was better just from cranial for her. That's so awesome. yeah, my, <laughs> we just kind of need to find a new person. Cause he's a little bit of a strange guy. My uh. husband calls him the crazy. He's like, I'm going to call the crazy head guy and try to start going back. <laughs> I'm like, well, we I feel like that's should. how you know you found someone good though. Yeah. Like, the crazier, the better. Yeah. He's, he's really crazy. <laughs> <laughs> like the crazy head guy. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Cause she'll get to a place where you can tell, like she'll, she'll tell you she has a headache and like, and we're doing cranial normally. She doesn't like, she doesn't get headaches. So that's, that's awesome. really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And you have so many amazing posts on your Instagram. I'll make sure I link that in the show notes for anyone that's listening or, or watching. Um, but you have all these like really interesting diagrams of like, you can tell someone has adrenal issues. You can tell mm -hmm. nutrient deficiencies, like things mm -hmm. like that, just from looking at their eyes. Right. Yeah. So I've been getting really into like the iridology stuff lately. Um, I think it's useful. Like, I definitely think that it's, it's accurate because whenever I see like those nerve rings in the eye, they're kind of like circular grooves that are like in a circular pattern around the iris. Um, that is actually related to a tendency for stress and tension. And so they actually say that it's passed down to you. So like the more trauma and stress that was passed down to you in your family, the more of these like rings kind of, they're kind of like mm. grooves um, that are in a circular pattern on the iris. And so if you have these type of things in your iris, it can really give you a good insight into like things that you can do for your health. So like if someone has nerve rings, I often say like, 
you're probably burning through minerals faster. You have mm. higher magnesium burn rate. Um, you're probably burning through B vitamins more easily. Um, so you really need to, if you have this in your eye, it just tells you like, okay, this is what I'm prone to. I'm more prone to nervous system um, issues and anxiety and stress. So these are things I can do for my health to kind of mitigate that. Interesting. Yeah, that's, that's really fascinating. I'm always like, um, kind of curious about the pupil dilation as well. Mm -hmm. Right. Is, is that, can you talk about that also? Mm -hmm. So oftentimes if you are uh, sympathetic dominant, you have larger pupils Mm -hmm. because, um, the pupil dilates when it's wants to take in more light. And when you're in fight or flight, you need to be alert, right? So the pupils are dilated. You're looking Mm -hmm. out for any type of threat in the environment. So you're going to want to take in more light and be more alert. So chronic pupil pupil dilation can be a sign that you're stuck in fight or flight. Um, On the other end of it, it's like if you have pinpoint pupils, that's a sign that your uh, parasympathetic is too dominant. So it, depending on the nervous system um, and also how the pupils react to light. So a lot of times if the pupil, if you shine a light in the pupil and it kind of like pulses, it doesn't stay contracted or it opens up right away. That's telling me that there's a lot of adrenal stress Uh. and um, nervous system weaknesses. So I see that a lot in like people that are low thyroid and have like Hashimoto's. I often see like the pupil will be like going in and out like that instead of staying constricted. So depending on how long the pupil is able to stay constricted, will tell you about the resiliency um, of the nervous system. Well, that's so fascinating. Um, what would you say would be like a good routine for somebody that, I mean, obviously it's going to take care of their entire health, but if you're looking through the lens of like eye health, what would be some non-negotiables that you'd want to have people doing every single day to take care of their eye health? Yeah, so definitely, um, if you can, view the sunrise and the sunset every day. That's going to be really, really helpful for the circadian rhythm and keeping everything uh, working properly. It's going to regulate all the clocks in your body um, because every part of your body has a, is regulated by that. Um, so I would say definitely that making sure you're getting full spectrum light every day. Um, ideally you're also getting outside in the middle of the day, um, light before 10 AM, I think is some of the most important times to get it in because that helps the secretion of melatonin at night, um, which is also an antioxidant in your body. So I would say working on that, um, I would say Working on the circulation is going to be important for keeping your eyes healthy. So doing lymphatic work. So, you know, jumping on a trampoline, um, Mm. walking is really good way to move the lymphatics, castor oil packs, um, things like that. I really like the palming exercise. I think this is like Mm, a simple thing that that. people can do. Um, Basically, you just lay down with your eyes closed and you're just gently cupping your eyes with your palms. And you're feeling the warmth of that. Um, You're letting your eyes move around while you do this because a lot of us have bad habits with our eyes. So we stare. So we don't let our eyes move around as much as Mm -hmm. we should. So a lot of people that wear glasses have this habit. Um, And it's basically like you're not letting your eyes move around as much as they should be moving around because you're used to just keeping them in one spot. So Yeah. So good vision is very dynamic and it's flexible, right? So our eyes are always constantly shifting um, instead of just staying in one spot all the time. Um, You can stimulate your peripheral vision. So one way you can do this is, well, always, always look far away. So if you're on a computer for a while, every 20 minutes or so, just look far out into the distance. Um, remember to blink if you're on the computer and then you can try to keep something in your peripheral vision and not get tunnel vision while you're on the computer. And then you can also put like a post-it note in front of your central vision. And you can just do this exercise where you walk around and you try to only use your peripheral vision. Um, So yeah, just stimulating the peripheral vision, 
you can use if you're nearsighted or farsighted, you can wear the opposite prescription um, to kind of stimulate the eyes to work better um, in that, in the one that you're not good at, basically. Um, you can, if you wear reading glasses, I would make sure that you're using like the minimal magnification lens that you need. So not mm -hmm. giving your eyes too much power. And if you also wear reading glasses, you can practice reading like the smallest print you can find every day. So just put something on your fridge that's like really small print and then just read it every day. Gotcha. Because that helps you maintain like the flexibility of the lens. Got it. And then as far as nutrition goes, I mean, mm -hmm. do you think like more of like a West and a price style diet or are there specific things that people should be trying to include on a regular basis for their eye health? Yeah. So um, things that support the vitreous are going to be um, structured water, bone mm -hmm. broth, collagen, MSM. Um, definitely vitamin C is going to be one of the most important uh, supporting glutathione production. So you can use NAC eye drops to support mm. the glutathione uh, production. Um, the two main, you know, antioxidants in the eye are going to be the vitamin C and the glutathione. Um, so, you know, things like selenium, zinc, copper, that's all going to be really important. Um, with a lot of clients who have eye problems, I see, uh, especially like they have eye problems from thyroid disease. I see iodine coming up as low a lot. Um, I see iron coming up a lot for people that have eye problems. So working on the iron overload. Um, if you have dry eyes, I always recommend colostrum mm. um, because it's really high in lactoferrin. And they've actually found that people with dry eye have low levels of lactoferrin in their tears. So raw milk is going to be really good for dry eyes as well. Um, just because the components in the milk are actually some of the same components in your tears. Ah, okay. So including the lactoferrin um, and things like that. So, And people should probably kind of look into their mineral status as well. Mm -hmm. Would you say like, do you do yeah. HTMAs or more like yeah. blood draws or how do you usually have people look at their mineral status? Yeah. So I do HTMA mm. uh, with clients. Um, I also do bioresonance testing and I find that it lines up a lot with HTMA. So oftentimes I see I see copper coming up, mm -hmm. especially in uh, patients that have taken birth control. Oh, um, I yeah. always, in those patients, I always see uh, the copper and iron dysregulation in the eye, actually, when I do eye scans on people. Um, so I've noticed that a lot. Um, I've noticed that, you know, people that have had LASIK done, their eyes are very stressed. Um, they often need a lot of support. Mm. In terms of other nutrient deficiencies, I see selenium coming up a lot for the eye. Uh -huh. That's super important for eyesight. I see zinc coming up sometimes. Um, I've seen sulfur come up. And, um, it's going to be important for like the collagen production in the eye. So yeah, these are, um, I see B, certain B vitamins are really important for the eyes. Yeah. And then also just increasing blood flow. So eye movement actually increases blood flow oh. and helps stimulate the vagus nerve. So, so do you have them do like specific eye exercises then? Mm -hmm. So one of the things actually people don't realize is going from light to dark is really good for stimulating blood flow in the eye. Oh. So if you're going out outside to inside is actually a really good way to like stimulate the blood flow. Nice. Um, there's eye exercises you can do for like eye movements. You can kind of imagine that your eyes are going in a circle and looking at, um, the different numbers on a clock. So you'll slowly do that with your eyes. Um, things like that can be super helpful for increasing circulation and relaxing the muscles. Very cool. 
That's super helpful. And you're always putting up, like, I'm, I'm going to, like I said earlier, put all of your links in the show notes for everybody watching, but your page is so fascinating. I'm like, <laughs> just, you. yeah, you put up the coolest stuff because I feel like we, there's like the alternative health and then there's like alternative, 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 like <laughs> you're kind of like yeah. in that fringe, like beyond where people just aren't really looking at these things and they don't they don't make that connection of the health of their eyes with the rest of their body, with the mineral status, with, Mm -hmm. you know, circadian rhythms and all of that. Because like you said, in the very beginning, we've been told it's genetic, right. Or it's age. And Mm -hmm. I'm sure there is like probably a little bit of an age component that comes into play, but what's also kind of declining as we age is, you know, our mineral status and and those types of things as well. Right. And you're depleting your antioxidants too, because there's more oxidative stress. Oh. Um, and then the other thing I think people don't realize is that everyone says like, you know, take the carotenoids uh, mm-hmm. for your eye health. Um, but I think people don't realize is that melanin is like way more important than the carotenoids. So like, I'd rather just take like chaga rather yeah. than like take, you know, all these like lutein and zeaxanthin supplements that are synthetic and yeah. not really not in natural occurring amounts. Yep. Um, and so I think that's where you can kind of get caught up and it doesn't really help, even though it's like a natural solution. Um, it's not really the best solution. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like, um, the melanin topic doesn't get discussed enough either. And it's, um, Mm -hmm. I'm doing a, I'm in like a quantum health, like Patreon and I get to talk to all these interesting people every week. And that's one of the things we were talking about last week is just the whole melanin aspect. Mm -hmm. And like the more, um, I guess during the summer, people have a lot less health problems. We were talking about dental health, strangely enough last week. And they were like, yeah, people think that when they're tanner, that their teeth, it makes their teeth look Mm -hmm. whiter, but their teeth are actually healthier. (laughs) Yeah. When they're I've tanner. Actually, <laughs> I actually definitely noticed that lately. I was noticing today that like my teeth look so much healthier. And I think yeah. it's because I've been getting more sun and I've been upping my iodine. Ah. I think that's really helping. I've so been you, noticing that my teeth are like less translucent, ah. if that makes sense. And they yep. just feel like healthier and stronger. And I think the sun is playing a big role in that. Yeah. Because obviously yeah. I was in New York. I wasn't getting a lot of sun before <laughs> uh, the summer. Yeah, that's tough. I mean, the geographic thing is hard. Like I'm I'm never moving north of Georgia. Like if anything, I want to come down here, Florida, where I am now. Like mm-hmm. that's the eventual goal is to be in the South because yeah. my health is definitely, I just feel so much better in the summer. I mean, it's, yeah. it's remarkable. My sister was like, I've never seen you this tan before. I'm like, <laughs> it's just, <laughs> I'm addicted I, I to personally, it. Yeah. I feel so much better when I have in the summer than I do in the winter. It's crazy. Yeah, me too. Yeah. I, this winter though, I did a lot of like the cold plunging and mm-hmm. all that kind of stuff, which you got to be careful not to overdo those things do, yeah. for sure, especially women. But that helped me. I feel like keep my health in a better place and mm-hmm. do a lot of outdoor hikes. But I mean, if you live mm-hmm. in like Canada, it's kind of a little bit harder to do outdoor hikes (laughs) during the winter. (laughs) So yeah, cool. Well, I feel like we've talked about so many interesting topics that hopefully people are going to find a lot of value of, and and hopefully people are going to go follow you on your social media as well, but what's the best way for people to find you if they do want to follow your work or even work with you? I don't know if you do consultations Mm -hmm. or anything like that, but is what's, how how would they do that? Um, So if you go to my Instagram, I'm working on my website right now. It's not done yet though. But if you go to my Instagram, I have a link and then you can schedule a free discovery call with me um, on my Calendly. And yeah, so I do, I run HTMAs. I do bioresonance testing, functional blood work. um, And I'm also going to be doing iridology soon. So I'll be adding that. And yeah, if they want to work with me, that's where they could find me. Awesome. Well, I'll make sure to link all that below. I'll get those links from you. And thanks for coming on and chatting with me. This has been awesome today. This is really fun. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Awesome.